If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1, and then also we're going to go to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to kind of bounce around a little bit between Luke 1, Matthew 1, and then back into Luke 2. We begin a new series today that's entitled The Stars of Christmas. And we're going to be looking at some key people in the Christmas story leading up to Jesus' birth. This first week here we'll be looking at Mary and Joseph, then we'll begin to look at the shepherds and angels, then we'll look at the three magi and King Herod, and then we'll also look at Simeon and Anna, and some of the other individuals, a part of this cast, if you will, we will cover in some of our midweek emails, people like Elizabeth and Zechariah and John the Baptist, the infamous innkeeper, those individuals will break those down in emails throughout the week. This Christmas story opens with a couple named Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. And this couple is unable to have kids. But one day, the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and declares that Elizabeth will soon become pregnant despite their old age. And that their son, who is John, which we would know as John the Baptist, is going to be a special man that God is going to use to prepare the way of the Lord. And that's how things begin in Luke chapter 1. And then the scene shifts to Mary and Joseph, whom we're talking about today. And so before we get into our first passage, I want to take a moment to pray together and ask the Lord's blessing upon this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to dive into the Christmas story This written account that's inspired by your Spirit reveals to us the advent of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as I've been praying this week, Jesus, I've been asking you to help me share with people what you want them to know about your earthly parents. They were very special to you. And so help us to be able to lean in and see a little bit of their lives and the things that they encountered as you were brought into the world to think of the significance of the fact that you became their son, one they would raise and and watch grow and be in awe and wonder of who you were and who you are. We ask for your grace upon this time in the Word. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we start here in the book of Luke. And um, just a heads up, many scholars believe that Luke actually learned the details of the Christmas story from Mary herself. Luke was a guy compiling all these different um, views and testimonials and kind of bringing them in here to the gospel of Luke. And so it's thought that he received quite a bit of this information from Mary herself. We're starting here in verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. And she was engaged to be married to a man, Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive And give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, Mary asked the angel, Well, how can this happen? I am a virgin. 
The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Other translations say nothing is impossible for God. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Verse 39, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived, and she entered the house and she greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, John, leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. So just a few days after the visit with Gabriel, Mary clearly is carrying Jesus inside of her womb. Carrying on here in verse 46, this is known as the Magnificat, Mary's song, which comes from the word magnify. And Mary says in verse 46, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. Now the rest of Mary's song emphasizes God's heart for the poor, God's heart for the oppressed, and God's heart for those who are despised. This first passage here that we've walked through focuses in on Jesus' mother, Mary, and so we'll begin to unpack some things with her. And one of the greatest miracles, miracles of all time here is prophetically spoken of by the angel Gabriel. And this miracle is the virgin birth. That's a big deal, the virgin birth. There had never been one before, nor has there been one since. And the entire gospel hangs on this virgin birth. Because in order for Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world, His transition into humanity needs to be Perfect. And so I want to list to you some references here from the Scriptures that clearly state that Jesus was perfect. Verses acknowledging Jesus' perfection. 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible says Jesus knew no sin. Hebrews 4.15, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted like us, yet He did not sin. Hebrews 7.26 says that Jesus is holy and He's blameless and He's pure and He's set apart from sinners and that He's exalted above the heavens. In 1 Peter 2.22, it simply says that He committed no sin. And in 1 John 3, verse 5, it says that in Jesus there is no sin. He is perfect. Jesus is and was and always has been and always will be perfect. Not only free from original sin, but free from all sin. That's why the virgin birth is a huge deal. Let's unpack this a little bit more. The Bible is very clear that Mary was a virgin. It's listed several times here in Luke 1. It'll be listed again in Matthew chapter 1. 
The Bible is also clear that Mary was not free from original sin. Another way to say this is that Mary was a sinner like you and like me. And we can get this from the Scriptures. If we walk through our imperfections, here's some verses that clearly state that humanity is not perfect. Psalm 143, verse 2, No one is righteous before God. Ecclesiastes 7, 20, There's not one person who doesn't sin. Romans 3, verse 9, All are under, all are under the power of sin. Romans 3, 23, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in 1 John 1, verse 8, it says, We cannot say that we have no sin. We would be made out as liars. We've all sinned. And Mary even recognizes her own need of spiritual salvation because in verse 47, when she gives this song, she says she's calling out to God her Savior. If she was perfect, she wouldn't need saved. But we're recognizing that she very much is a sinner like you and like me. And one of the reasons that people might believe that Mary was free from original sin is because Gabriel, when he visited her, he said, you're highly favored, which means there's much grace in your life. But the Greek word used right there for highly favored is also used in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, when it speaks of God's favor upon those who believe in Jesus Christ. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're highly favored. The same exact favor that was on Mary. Mary was highly favored. Believers in Christ are highly favored. And this is not a favor that makes a person sinless. It's a recognition that one's life is accompanied by much grace. There was much grace in Mary's life. There's much grace in the life of a believer. Even with this grace operating in our life, the Bible is clear that we all have a sin nature that is passed down through Adam and Eve, also known as original sin. And you and I, we pass that sin nature on to our biological children. Newsflash, your children are sinners. This sin nature was not passed along to Jesus. What's interesting here is that in the genealogy of Jesus that's listed in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew actually separates Jesus from Joseph. The Bible cuts ties for Jesus with any sin-natured earthly biological father. In Matthew 1, it reads this genealogy and it says things like, Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac was the father of Jacob. And it goes on and says that Jesse was the father of King David and King David was the father of Solomon. And it continues to go on and on. We get to Joseph's dad, Jacob, and it says Jacob was the father of Joseph. And then when it goes to describe Joseph, it doesn't say he was the father of Jesus. It says that he was the husband of of Mary. Ties cut. Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Mary is Jesus' biological mother. So here's a question that I have then kind of brewing. If Jesus is perfect and we look at that he can't have a sin nature passed along to him, he's born of a virgin, but she still had a sin nature. So then how can Jesus actually be perfect? Well, the answer comes to us in verse 35. 
the overshadowing and the power of God. The angel replies, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So, the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. God. There's a powerful thing taking place in the overshadowing. And that word overshadow, if you were to look at that word and try to find it elsewhere in the Scripture, you'll see it in a couple of different accounts. The first one being the transfiguration of Jesus. Where Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, they're up on this mountain, and all of a sudden there's an overshadowing. And they're taken over by the presence of God. And another place where that word is used is in the book of Acts when the apostle Peter might be walking through the streets and the people who are needing healed know that the power of God is working through Peter. If they could just get into his shadow, they might get healed. That's where that word is also used. But that's the only two other accounts besides this moment that Mary would have where there would be a supernatural conception. A powerful moment, a supernatural moment that would produce for Mary a perfect egg for this perfect conception. Some might call it immaculate, which at its core, immaculate means without the stain of sin. Jesus' birth was very much immaculate, without the stain of sin. But hear me, it does not mean that Mary herself was perfect. It's because she had this moment in which the power of God overshadowed her and the perfect conception took place. Because of this miracle, Jesus is fully man and He's fully God. This is called the hypostatic union, and it's the combining of divine nature connecting with the human nature perfectly into one person. This is God in the flesh, and this is a huge deal because the curse of sin and the conquering of that curse must be met by a perfect sacrifice. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5 says that when the set time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And how are we redeemed? We are redeemed by the blood of our perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. In the Old Covenant, atonement for sin came through the shed blood of several different kinds of animals, one of them being lambs, and they would do this over and over and over and over and over again throughout history. In the New Covenant, atonement for sin comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb sacrificed once for all. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, it says that you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from that empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, that is your sin nature. We just covered that. But we're redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Wow. Wow. So as I've been sitting on this throughout the week, there was a question that came to mind, and I'm about to tiptoe into an area that I am no expert. But a question I have is, is while Jesus was in the womb, was there any shared blood with his mother, Mary? Well, there's different views on that. I reached out to several different people. And I'm just going to share with you a few things that I found. I'm no expert, but I'm just saying, is it possible that Jesus was protected in all of this? This is from a textbook called Introductory Biology. We're going to go to school here for a second. Regarding the development of a child and the placenta. 
It says the baby could not grow and develop without oxygen and nutrients from the mother. That's a no-brainer right there. Waste from the baby must also be removed in order for it to be or for it to survive. And the exchange of these substances between the mother and the baby occurs through the placenta. Now the placenta is a temporary organ that begins to form from the trophoblast layers of cells shortly after implantation. Stay with me, okay? Getting lost in the words. The placenta continues to develop and grow to meet the needs of the growing baby. And a fully developed placenta is made up of a large mass of blood vessels from both the mother and the baby. The mother's and baby's blood vessels are close together, but separated by tiny spaces. This allows the mother's and the baby's blood to exchange substances across their capillary walls without the blood actually mixing. The baby is connected to the placenta through the umbilical cord, a tube that contains two arteries and a vein. The blood from the baby enters the placenta through the umbilical arteries, exchanges gases and other substances with the mother's blood, and then travels back to the baby through the umbilical vein. There are some exceptions with this because we see that in our medical field, particularly with what's called the RH factors. WebMD says normally a mother and a baby's blood supply do not mix during pregnancy, but during childbirth or any time really, some baby blood could enter into the mother's system and that's where you get into some of these RH factors where the mother's antibodies will actually start attacking the child. And it can lead to complications. Just some interesting stuff there. I'll let you chew on that, but is it possible that God the Creator knows what He's doing and how redemption is necessary for humanity? I find these things very fascinating. Well, getting back to Mary, we know that she's a very godly woman. She's a wonderful wife. She's a wonderful mother. She deserves our respect. I know I've called her a sinner a couple of times in this passage, and that's truth, but I say that respectfully because it's truth. And the Bible calls her blessed, and what's interesting is Mary is the only human that was present at both Jesus' birth and Jesus' death. Two of the greatest moments in all of history. Shift with me now to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, verse 18 is where we'll begin. We're going to get to know Joseph a little bit more now. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Well, we are now learning about this man, Joseph. He's a God-fearing, God-honoring Jewish man. He's a blue-collar kind of guy, a carpenter, yet he also had this lineage of King David, which is a big deal. And we see that he's now being faced with some pretty intense circumstances and some pretty heavy life decisions. 
this lady that you're engaged to is now pregnant, and Joseph had nothing to do with that. What is he going to do? He's sort of caught into a heavy circumstance here. I want to take a moment to navigate what's called the betrothal agreement. We don't necessarily hear of this in our culture, but in the Jewish culture, a betrothal was a legal agreement. It was a contractually binding agreement between two families, the family of the groom and the family of the bride. And they would come together, they would make this agreement for their children to get married, and then a public announcement would get made. I'm sure they'd send a photo and information to the local newspaper and Out it goes, the Jerusalem Times or Nazareth News. But announcement is made, and it's followed by a 12-month engagement. And this engagement was as binding as the marriage itself. The bride and groom would even start calling each other husband and wife during this period. And they also, in the midst of this, because they weren't officially married yet, they refrained from living together, and they refrained from sexual activity until they were officially married. And if something came up, like what happened for Mary and Joseph, a formal divorce was required to get out of the engagement, which hopefully wouldn't be necessary, but provisions had been made And in this particular case, Joseph has some things that he needs to sort through, doesn't he? Men, imagine your fiancé getting pregnant and you know that you're not the one involved. You're supposed to take her word for it. I mean, come on, doesn't that sound crazy? I mean, we, we can see the other side of the story, but Joseph is right in the thick of it. What am I supposed to do with this? I love this woman. I want to believe her. But this isn't possible. I just got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. I know Joseph's a God-fearing man, but that sounds a little bit crazy. I'm sure he felt wounded. I'm sure he felt confused by what seemed like Mary's infidelity. And he's working through the optics of all of this. I mean, he's from a small town. Anybody know small town, rural, okay? News travels. You can't walk anywhere without people knowing your business. People are going to know. Did you hear Mary's pregnant? I heard it's from the Holy Spirit. What's up with that? I mean, people had to think this was nuts. Absolutely nuts. And the evidence would point to the capital offense of adultery. And if Joseph went through with this, Mary could be killed. And he's probably thinking, if I marry her, there's this social disgrace that would take place of all these people thinking that I got her pregnant. Think of the tension here. Think of the tension for Mary. She's a teenager. For context, roughly 8th grade, freshman, okay parents, think that through a little bit. Your daughter coming home and telling you she got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That would be so far-fetched. And in the midst of this, Mary could have well been rejected by Joseph. And he could have moved on. And if she would have been rejected by Joseph, then the care for her would come through her father. And if she would have rejected her, it would have likely led Mary into this life of poverty and begging. And go even worse than that, it could have led her into a life of prostitution in order to make ends meet. You consider all this tension that's going on, Jewish tradition demanded that there would be harsh treatment for unmarried pregnant women, and religious leaders would have dealt with Mary in a very serious way. You know, Jewish historians claim that Jewish women would actually secretly pray 
that they might be the ones who get to be the mother of the Messiah. But I bet they never would have imagined it would come with these kinds of conflicts. Going through Mary's mind might be things like, what's Joseph going to think? What's Joseph going to do? But she's trusting the Lord that through the appearance of the angel Gabriel, even though this may not make sense to me and there's even hints of that as she puts forward this confusion, she's willing to trust the Lord even when it doesn't fully make sense. But Joseph has to process a few things, doesn't he? I sat on this question, why didn't the angel just appear to Joseph right after he appeared to Mary? That would settle some of the stress and tension, wouldn't it? But here Joseph has to process, what am I going to do with what has been dealt into my life? Perhaps this was an opportunity for God to test the quality of one man's faith and one man's character before he had the ability to see what was actually going on. We do not know the exact answer to that we can only speculate but what we see going on here in Joseph's response is that he's a good and he's a gentle man even in the midst of the tension he decides that he probably will divorce her but do it quietly so as not to heap shame and abandonment upon Mary and to make her life miserable but then Joseph gets the Appearance of an angel. That certainly helps things, doesn't it? (laughs) And after the angelic visit, Joseph honors God first and foremost, and then he honors Mary. And he says, I'm going to continue to walk with her. I'm going to continue to take her as my wife. People might have some things to say about me. If I'd have ended this, Mary's reputation was just on the line. But now that I'm saying I'm going to move forward with the right thing to do, my reputation is on the line. And even though she's pregnant and now they're moving forward, it didn't cause Joseph to speed things up. Well, since you're pregnant, we might as well enter into some of the things that are reserved for the marriage covenant. But he chose to honor God and honor her through the process. And in verse 24 of this passage, it says that Joseph did what was commanded of him. He was obedient. So now jump with me back into Luke. The final section here. Luke 2, starting in verse 1. It says, at that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. Every 14 years or so, Rome would take a census for military and tax purposes. And this census forced Joseph and Mary to travel quite a distance. And this was not an easy journey. The mileage ranging anywhere between 70 to 100 miles in this journey. And you think of the terrain. It's not flat. It's very mountainous, this uphill journey. In fact, Bethlehem is south of Nazareth, yet the Scriptures say they went up to Bethlehem, and that's because of the elevation. This was not an easy 
journey. And could you imagine if she was having any contractions while on this trip? Ladies, have any of you experienced contractions? How about contractions in the car? Anyone? Yeah. Was that an enjoyable experience for you? No. Could you imagine doing that on an animal? This was quite a journey. And they were being obedient and going through the process even though it was going to be difficult. And what I love in the midst of this, guys, is the sovereignty of God at work here in the gospel story. God's timing of all of this. Causing Caesar Augustus to put forward a decree will put Mary and Joseph in this town of Bethlehem with which the prophet Micah had said that will be the city in which the Savior will be born. God is orchestrating and sends them to Bethlehem which is known as the house of bread. How fitting that the birthplace of the bread of life is in Bethlehem, the house of bread. God sets all of this in motion and He is sovereignly working out His plan of redemption. So in closing today, I want to look at the responses of Mary and Joseph in the midst of all that they are navigating. This is loaded. I mean, I think we've all walked through some life circumstances, but could you imagine going through something like this? But I love the response, the example that they are for us. Mary and Joseph's love for God in the midst of all that they were facing, their faith in His Word, their purity of their heart and their actions, and then their obedience and their service unto the Lord, their faithfulness to the task that had been placed before them. In particular, Mary's response when she finds out these things in Luke 1, she says, let me be a servant. That's her response. Let me be a servant. Can you imagine being chosen to have Jesus living inside of you. What a humbling thing to consider that this child that she would carry carries all the hope of the world. Can you imagine being chosen to have Jesus living inside of you? Can you imagine being chosen to have Jesus living inside of you. Folks, the reality of the new covenant is that the Savior of the world does live inside of those who put their faith and trust in Him. The Bible says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what's your response to the King of the world being in you? Are you humbled by that? What's our response? Do we go about life as usual? It's no big deal. Jesus lives in me, but I'll carry out my my own thing. Does that change anything? Do we go about life as usual, or do we respond with service to the King and the Kingdom? Later on, Jesus would say that we're even more blessed than Mary if we're people who hear God's Word and obey it. You know, Mary didn't fully understand that all that God had in store for her through all of this, but she submitted to God's will. She heard the Word and she obeyed it. What an example for all of us. And I want to point out that Joseph as he stepped forward to raise this child that was technically not his own, he raised Jesus up honorably. 
He made regular worship a priority. You saw him leading his family in that way. And he likely worked Jesus into the carpentry business. We know that Jesus was a carpenter. And what was that like when at a very young age, Jesus was making things that were way out of Joseph's league? I'm sure that was a little humbling. But they responded with service. They responded with obedience. How can we respond to the grace of Jesus in our lives? We respond with service to the King. We respond with obedience. No matter what's going on, if there's a whole bunch of life dynamics and tension in the midst of that, try to stay tuned to the voice of the Lord and say, I want your help. I want your guidance. I want your wisdom. Help me to make the right decision and to continue to serve, to continue to be obedient and to be faithful to the Lord's call. In closing, Luke 2.11 says that Jesus is the Savior and He's Christ the Lord. Jesus was Joseph's Savior. Jesus was Mary's Savior. And Jesus is our Savior. Savior. And so we respond. We respond to our Savior. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, you placed a call upon the lives of Joseph and Mary, and it was a big thing. And Lord, they walked forward into what it is you desired for them, even though it would not be easy. And Lord, for each of us, the call that you have on our life, help us to learn from this example and step forward in obedience and service to you and your kingdom. Lord, it's possible there's someone listening right now that they've not settled the issue of sin in their life, the original sin that was passed on, this sin nature they have that can only be settled by the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ that is applied by grace through faith. And today, if you would desire to receive the salvation that Jesus came to bring, then I want to encourage you to pray with me to receive this salvation. Simply say, Jesus, today I surrender my life to you. The Bible says I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And that is you. So I'm asking for forgiveness of my sin and that you would cleanse me and cover me with your perfect blood. I receive the forgiveness of my sin. I receive this gift of salvation. I receive you as my Savior. Thank you for this gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.